Chapter One. In the days when the spinning wheels hummed busily in the farmhouses, one often saw certain small, pale men in the countryside. Among the big, strong farm workers, these men looked like the remains of a disinherited race. The shepherd's dog barked fiercely when one of them walked by, bent under the weight of a heavy pack, and the shepherd himself looked at the pack suspiciously, even though he knew that it only contained linen cloth. I don't trust weavers," thought the shepherd. "Who knows? Perhaps the devil helps them with their work." In that far-off time, the country people were very superstitious. They did not like anything strange or new, and strange men who passed through the village were always viewed with suspicion. The villagers knew nothing of these men's origins. Where were their homes? Who were their fathers and mothers? And how can you trust someone if you do not know who his father and mother were? To the peasants of old times, the world outside their own direct experience was a region of mystery. Even if someone from distant parts settled in the village and lived there for many years, he was still viewed with distrust. The villagers would not have been surprised if, after years of living peacefully among them, he had committed some terrible crime. The linen weavers, who were immigrants from the town to the country, were distrusted even more than ordinary strangers because of their skill. Any kind of cleverness seemed to the villagers to be like witchcraft. They believed that honest people were not very clever. Whenever a linen weaver settled in a village, the local people regarded him as an alien not to be trusted, and so he lived in a state of loneliness. In the early years of this century, a linen weaver named Silas Marner lived and worked in a stone cottage close to an abandoned quarry near the village of Ravello. The village boys were fascinated by the sound of Silas's loom. They would often look through the windows of his cottage and watch him working. They were a little afraid of him, and so, to cover up their fear, they laughed at him. Imitating the strange sound of the loom and the bent shape of his body as he worked. When he heard them laughing, Silas came to the door, and the boys ran away. They thought perhaps he could harm them by magic, just by looking at them with his large, brown, short-sighted eyes. They had heard their parents say that Silas could cure illnesses with herbs, and they thought that if he could heal by magic. He could probably do harm by magic too. Silas had lived in Ravello for fifteen years. The villagers all thought that he was very strange. He never came to the Rainbow for a pint of beer. He never stopped to gossip in the village square. His only contact with men and women was that necessary for his work. At first, the village girls thought he would want to find a wife. And they declared that they would never marry a dead man come back to life again. They said this because Jem Rodney, the mole catcher, had told them a strange tale. One evening, as he was walking home from Squire Cass's woods, where he had been shooting birds, he saw Silas Marner standing still in a field, staring before him with the eyes of a dead man. Jem spoke to him and shook his arm. But the weaver did not reply or move. He stood there, rigid, as if he had died standing up. Then suddenly he was normal again. He looked at Jem, said "Good night," and walked off. When the villagers heard Jem's story, some of them said that Silas must have had a fit. But old Mister Macy shook his head and said that no one could have a fit without falling down. He believed that Silas's soul had left his body that evening, and if a man's soul leaves his body, it might meet with other spirits or demons and learn things from them. Mister Macy was convinced that this explained Silas's knowledge of herbs. How had he been able to cure Sally Oates when she was ill? None of the doctors had been able to cure her, but Silas's herbs had worked like magic. 
As the years went by, the villagers' opinion of Silas changed little, except that they began to wonder about his money. He worked all the time and was well paid for his cloth, yet he lived very simply and never spent much money. Where was all that money going? The thought that Master Mana had a pile of gold somewhere made him seem even more mysterious to the villagers, even more different from themselves. Chapter Two. Although his daily habits and his neighbours' opinion of him had changed very little over the years, Silas's inner life had been a history and a metamorphosis. Before he came to Ravello, his life had been full of companionship and mental activity. He had lived in the city and attended chapel at Lantern Yard. The community at Lantern Yard was part of a narrow religious sect in which even the poorest member could distinguish himself if he could speak well. The people at Lantern Yard had always considered Silas a very pious and virtuous young man, like many honest and fervent men. Silas had a strong sense of mystery. If he had been better educated, he might have found the explanations he sought in inquiry and knowledge. But since he had had little schooling, he turned to religion for explanations. His mother had taught him to recognize and prepare medicinal herbs. But during his years at Lantern Yard, he began to think that practicing his mother's skill might be sinful. He believed that the herbs would do no good without prayer, and that prayer might suffice without the herbs. Therefore, the pleasure of wandering through the fields in search of dandelion and foxglove began to seem like a temptation. Silas had a close friend at Lantern Yard called William Dane. He too was considered a pious and virtuous young man. However. The community thought him too severe with those who were not as virtuous as himself, and too proud of his own virtue, so that he considered himself wiser than his teachers. But Silas could see no faults in William. He looked at his friend with innocent admiration in his eyes. The expression of trusting simplicity on Mana's face was very different from the complacent expression. In Dane's narrow, slanting eyes and thin lips, Silas and William often discussed salvation. Silas said that he hoped he was among those chosen by God, but he could never feel sure. William, by contrast, declared that he was absolutely certain that he would be saved, because he had once had a dream in which he saw the words "election sure." Standing alone on the white page of an open Bible, Silas was engaged to a young woman named Sarah, who worked as a servant. She and Silas were saving their money so that they could get married. But one evening, something happened that changed Silas's future. In the middle of a prayer meeting, Silas became suddenly still, rigid, and unconscious. At first, the people at the prayer meeting thought that he was dead, but after more than an hour, he returned to normal. The people were then convinced that his mysterious, suspended state had a spiritual meaning. They thought that Silas had been chosen by God, and they asked him if he had had a vision during the trance. A less truthful man might have invented a vision to please them. And a less sane man might have believed his own invention, but Silas was both honest and sane, so he told them the truth. He had not had a vision. William Dane said that Silas's trance seemed more like a visitation of Satan than a sign of God's favor. He told Silas to examine his soul and to confess any sin he had kept secret. Silas felt hurt that his friend doubted him, and he noticed that Sarah too seemed to withdraw from him now. A short time after these events, the senior deacon of the chapel fell ill. 
Silas and William took turns watching the old man by night. Silas would sit by the deacon's bed until two in the morning, then William would take over until six. One night, Silas noticed that the old man had stopped breathing. He touched his arm and found that it was rigid. The deacon must have been dead for some time. Silas looked at the clock. It was four in the morning. Did I fall asleep? Silas asked himself. And why did William not come as usual at two o'clock? Silas went to tell the others what had happened. Then he went to work. But at six o'clock, William and the minister of the church came to Silas's house. William said, "Silas, why did you not come at two o'clock this morning as usual?" I felt ill," said William. "But we came here to talk about something more important. There was a bag of money in a locked drawer in the deacon's bedside table. The bag has been stolen, Silas, and your knife was found in the drawer. I swear before God that I am innocent," cried Silas. "I must have been asleep, or perhaps I had another trance like the one you witnessed at the prayer meeting." And the thief must have come in while I was in the trance. They searched Silas's house, and William found the empty bag which had contained the money hidden behind the wardrobe in Silas's bedroom. Confess, Silas! cried William in a stern voice. Silas looked at him with reproach in his eyes and said, "William, you have been my friend for nine years." When have you known me to lie? But God will prove my innocence. The people of Lantern Yard never called the police when a crime was committed in their community. They had their own ways of discovering innocence or guilt. They decided to draw lots. That way, God could show them who was the guilty one. The lots declared that Silas Mana was guilty. The minister told Silas that he must confess, repent his sin, and give the money back. Otherwise, he would be expelled from the community. Silas walked up to William Dane and said in an agitated voice, "Now I remember. My knife was not in my pocket. You borrowed it. You stole the money, and now you are trying to blame me." But your sin will not be discovered, because there is no just God who governs the earth. There is only a God of lies who bears witness against the innocent. The community was shocked by these blasphemous words. William said, "I leave our brothers and sisters to judge whether or not this is the voice of Satan." Silas, I will pray for you. Silas looked at Sarah. But she turned away from him with a look of disgust on her face. One month later, Sarah married William Dane, and Silas left Lantern Yard. It was in this unhappy state that Silas had come to Ravello. He had lost his faith in God and his fellow man. All that remained for him was work. So he worked all day, every day, mindlessly. Like a spider spinning its web, his customers paid him in coins of gold and silver, and he kept them in an iron pot. As time went on, Silas began to love those coins. Every day he worked for sixteen hours, but at night he took his coins out of the pot and counted them. Their shapes and colours became familiar to him. He loved to look at them and touch them. He removed some bricks from the floor of his cottage underneath the loom, and dug a hole there in which to hide the iron pot. So, year after year, Silas lived in this solitude, with no human companionship, and the only love in his life was the love he felt for the gold and silver coins in his iron pot. Chapter three. The greatest man in Ravello was Squire Cass, who lived in the large red house by the church. Squire Cass's wife had died many years ago. He lived with his sons. 
The villagers thought that the eldest son, Godfrey, was a handsome, pleasant young man. They hoped that soon he would marry Miss Nancy Lameter, for it was well known that Godfrey and Nancy were fond of each other. But the villagers did not like Squire Cass's second son, Dunstan. They considered him a spiteful fellow who laughed at other people's misfortunes and wasted all his money on gambling and drink. Recently, people had noticed that Godfrey was not as healthy and happy as usual. They feared that perhaps his younger brother was leading him astray, encouraging him to drink and to gamble. One evening, Godfrey and Dunstan were alone in the living room of the Great Red House. Dunstan had been drinking brandy. His plump face was red and his eyes were bright. He looked at his brother's sad, pale face with a sneering smile. Dunstan, you must pay me back that money I lent you, said Godfrey. It was the rent I had collected for father, and now he is asking me for it. But I haven't got the money, Dunstan replied. Why don't you find the money to pay father back? You know, dear brother, that if I told father your secret, he would cut you off without a penny. But I cannot find the money to pay him, cried Godfrey. Oh, I'm sure you will. Otherwise, I'll tell him that his handsome son was married in secret to Molly Farron. She was such a nice young woman until she started to drink too much and take opium. Perhaps I will tell father everything, and after all he'll know some time. She has been threatening to come to the house and tell him herself. If I tell father, at least you won't be able to torture me any more. Don't be ridiculous, Godfrey. You can sell your horse wildfire and pay father back. I'll help you to sell the horse. Do you know Bryce, the horse dealer in Ravelo? I know him very well, and I'm sure he will pay one hundred and twenty pounds for Wildfire. Godfrey covered his eyes with his hands and sighed. Wildfire was the best horse he had ever owned, but he had to get the money somehow. All right, he said, take Wildfire and sell him, but don't spend any of the money. The next morning, Dunstan mounted Wildfire and set off for the village. He rode past the deep pit of the abandoned quarry and past Silas Marner's cottage. Dunstan had often heard the villagers say that Silas had a lot of money. He thought he could probably frighten the weaver into giving him his money, but then Godfrey would not lose Wildfire. Dunstan preferred to sell the horse. Because he knew it would pain Godfrey, Dunstan rode to the village, found Bryce, and agreed to sell Wildfire to him that afternoon. He could have sold the horse immediately and walked home with the money in his pocket, but he wanted to go riding first. He rode out to the fields to jump some fences. He enjoyed riding and jumping for a couple of hours, but as he was jumping one last fence. Wildfire was pierced with a hedge stake and fell down dead. Dunstan staggered to his feet and drank from the flask of brandy he always carried with him. The horse was dead, and the hundred and twenty pounds Bryce would have paid for him were lost. Now Dunstan would have to walk home, and that seemed to him a humiliating thing. He always rode on horseback to and from the village. It was nearly four o'clock, and a fog was gathering. Dunstan started walking home along the lonely lane, drinking his brandy and swearing at his misfortune. The sky grew darker and the fog thicker as Dunstan walked along. Then suddenly he saw a light. Dunstan realized that it must be coming from the window of Silas Marner's cottage. He decided to knock on the door and ask the old weaver to lend him a lantern. Once he was inside the cottage, he would also ask Silas to lend him some money. He would promise to pay interest, and if Silas was still unwilling to part with the gold, he would frighten him a little. With this plan in mind, Dunstan knocked loudly on the door of the cottage. 
There was no answer, so Dunstan pushed the door and it opened. A great fire was burning in the fireplace, but the cottage was empty. Dunstan wondered why Mana had left his cottage unlocked. Perhaps he had got lost in the fog and had fallen into the abandoned quarry. If so, he would certainly drown. The pit had been full of water for many years. Dunstan thought of taking the money. If the old weaver were dead, no one would ever know that it had been stolen. He looked around the cottage, searching for a hiding place. The brick floor was sprinkled with sand, but in one place the sand had been smoothed by a hand. Dunstan got down on his knees and pulled at the bricks. They came out easily, and in the hole beneath he saw an iron pot full of coins. Quickly, Dunstan replaced the bricks and smoothed the sand over them. He took the iron pot and left the cottage, closing the door behind him. Then he hurried out into the darkness. Chapter Four. That evening, Silas had gone to take some linen to Mrs. Lamiter's house. The fog was thick, and it had started to rain as he was walking home. By the time he got back to his cottage, he was cold, wet, and tired. Silas sat by the fire, glad of the warmth. The long hours of work were over, and now was the best time of his day—the time when he ate his supper and counted his money. Silas removed the bricks from the floor, but the hole was empty. He began to tremble violently. Desperately, he searched the hole again and again. He searched the entire cottage, but his gold was nowhere to be found. He ran out of his cottage and down the lane to the village in the rain. The village men would all be at the rainbow now, drinking beer and laughing together. He would go to the rainbow and tell them all that he had been robbed. The company at the rainbow that evening was very merry. A great fire was blazing in the fireplace, and the air was warm and smoky. Jem Rodney was there, and old Mr. Macy, the tailor and parish clerk too. Ben Winthrop, the wheelwright, Oates, the cobbler, Bryce, the horse dealer, and many others. They were drinking beer, telling jokes, and laughing when the door burst open, and there stood Silas Marner, soaking wet, trembling. And as white as a ghost, I've been robbed! Cried Silas to the astonished crowd. My gold is gone. Someone has taken it. I need the policeman and the judge. Calm down now, Master Marner," said Mr. Snell, the landlord, coming out from behind the bar to take Silas's arm. Come and sit by the fire and tell us what happened. Silas sat down and told his story. The company asked him many questions as the mysterious nature of the robbery became apparent. They shook their heads in sympathy at his distress. Some were of the opinion that the devil had stolen Silas's gold, but others said that it was just some stranger passing through. Finally, they put on their coats and took Silas to find the policeman. And to tell the judge all about it. The next day, the whole village was talking about the robbery. Everyone went up to Silas's cottage and searched the area for clues. The rain had washed away any footprints, but they found a tinder box in the mud near the abandoned quarry. Mister Snell said that he had seen a travelling pedlar with a tinder box passing through the village the day before. The peddler must have stolen Silas's gold, but Mister Macy shook his head and said, "No, this was much more mysterious than an ordinary robbery." Later, in the Rainbow, two camps of opinion formed. Members of the peddler and tinderbox camp, headed by Mister Snell, were convinced that the stranger was the thief. But members of the supernatural camp, headed by Mister Macy, argued that God had caused the gold to vanish in order to punish Silas for loving gold too much.
the two camps were involved in an animated argument when Godfrey came into the rainbow. He was worried about Dunstan and wildfire. Dunstan had not returned home the previous night, and Godfrey was afraid that his brother had sold the horse and gone off to spend the money on gambling and drink. Looking around the faces in the rainbow, Godfrey saw Bryce the horse dealer. Hello, Mr. Bryce. Uh, have you seen my brother Dunstan? Yes, indeed, said Bryce. I saw him yesterday. What an unfortunate fellow he is. What do you mean? asked Godfrey. Did he not tell you? Mr. Bryce told Godfrey all about the accident and Wildfire's death. Godfrey left the rainbow even more worried than he had been when he arrived. Now there was no way he could find a hundred pounds to pay his father. It seemed to him that he would have to confess everything. Now his father would be furious with him, and Nancy Lameter would never marry him. Before, he had hoped that one day his wife Molly would take too much opium and die, leaving him free to marry Nancy. Then no one would ever know about his secret past. But now he would have to tell his father, and his father would tell Mr. Lameter, and he, Godfrey, would lose everything. Chapter 6 While Godfrey was forgetting the sorrows of his secret life in the sweet company of Nancy Lameter, his wife Molly was walking with slow, uncertain steps through the snow-covered Ravelo lanes, carrying her sleeping child in her arms. She had decided to go to the Red House on New Year's Eve to humiliate him in front of all his friends. Ever since he had told her that he would never acknowledge her as his wife, she had been planning this act of revenge. He would be at the Red House, smiling and dancing. She would go there and show herself, her ragged clothes and her faded face that had once been beautiful, and, with their child in her arms, she would tell the old squire that she was his eldest son's wife. She knew that her poverty was not Godfrey's fault. She had spent all the money he had given her on opium. Yet she felt bitterness towards him. He lived in a fine house and wore fine clothes, while she lived in misery. As she walked on, the snow fell more and more thickly. She needed comfort, and the only comfort she knew was the lump of opium hidden in her dress. But she did not wish to take it, because she had to take care of her child. For a while she struggled against her desire for the opium, but finally she lost the struggle, swallowed the opium and walked on. The wind was freezing and Molly walked more and more slowly and drowsily. She longed to lie down and sleep. Finally she lay down by a small bush on a bank of snow. She leaned her back against the bush as if it were a pillow. At first she held her child tightly to her bosom, but slowly her hands relaxed and the child's blue eyes opened wide in the cold starlight. Mummy, called the child, but there was no answer. There was a gleam of light nearby. The child crawled away from her mother to catch the bright thing. Then she looked up and saw that the light was coming from a very bright place. Slowly she got up and walked through the snow to the open door of Silas Marner's cottage. There she saw a fire blazing in the fireplace. She went up to the fire and sat in front of it on the hearth, making little noises of pleasure. Then the warmth made her sleepy, and she lay her golden head on the floor and fell asleep. But where was Silas while this strange visitor had come to his hearth? He was in the cottage, but he did not see her. During the weeks since the robbery, he had developed the habit of opening his door and looking out, as if he thought his money might be coming back to him. On this evening, he had looked out more eagerly than usual, 
because his neighbours had told him that it was good luck to sit up till midnight on New Year's Eve, and that, if he did so, his money might come back. He had stood by the door, looking out at the wide expanse of snow and listening to the silence. Just as he was about to close the door, he fell into a trance. He stood there, still and rigid, with wide, sightless eyes, holding open his door, powerless to resist either the good or the evil that might enter there. When the trance was over, Silas continued the action of closing the door, unaware that any time had passed. He returned to his chair by the fire. The light from the fire was dim now, and Silas's eyesight was poor. Looking down, he thought he saw gold on the floor. Gold! His own gold brought back to him as mysteriously as it had been taken away. His heart began to beat violently. He stretched out his hand to touch the gold, but instead of hard coins, his fingers touched soft, warm curls. Silas fell on his knees in amazement. It was a sleeping child, a lovely, round child with golden curls all over her head. At the touch of his fingers, the child awoke and cried out, Mummy! Silas took her in his arms and rocked her to comfort her. Then he warmed up some soup and fed it to her with a spoon. After she had eaten, the child began to pull at her boots. They were wet and uncomfortable. As he took off her boots, Silas realised that she must have been walking in the snow. So she had not appeared by magic after all. She had wandered in off the road. With the child in his arms, Silas went to the door and looked out. He could see her small footprints in the snow. Silas followed the footprints. Finally, he came to a bank of snow with a small bush and a dark shadow on it. But only when the child cried out, Mummy! Mummy! did Silas realise that the shadow was a human body. I must find the doctor, cried Silas. He remembered that all the ladies and gentlemen of the village were dancing at Squire Cass's house that evening, so he hurried along the lane towards the big red house with the child in his arms. By this time, the party at the red house was very merry indeed. Ladies and gentlemen were dancing and drinking wine. The air was full of conversation and laughter. Godfrey was just about to ask Nancy to dance with him again when he heard a disturbance at the door. Looking up, he saw what seemed to him an apparition from the dead. Silas Marner stood there, wet with snow and holding Godfrey's own child in his arms. Godfrey had not seen the child for several months, but he recognised her immediately, and his face turned pale. I need the doctor, cried Silas. There's a woman out there in the snow. I think she's dead. Godfrey's heart leapt. There was one terror in his mind at that moment. It was that the woman might not be dead. Generally, Godfrey was a kind man, but anyone whose life depends on secrecy is bound to have evil wishes. Godfrey joined the crowd of people around the weaver. Whose child is that? asked Nancy, appearing at his side. I don't know, Godfrey replied. I think she belongs to some poor woman who has been found ill in the snow. Mrs. Kimball, the doctor's wife, turned to Silas and said, Leave the child here. One of the servant girls will take care of her. No, cried Silas. She came to me. I have a right to keep her. Come on, said Dr. Kimball, pulling on his coat. There's no time to lose. I'll come with you, said Godfrey. Dr. Kimball sent a servant into the village to find Mrs. Winthrop. Then he hurried out with Godfrey, Silas and the child. When they reached the cottage, Silas took the child in to warm her by the fire. 
Dr. Kimball and Godfrey went straight to the snowbank and carried the woman's body back to the cottage. By the time they got there, Mrs. Winthrop had arrived. They put the woman's body down on the floor, far from the fire, where Silas was rocking the child to sleep. It's too late, said Dr. Kimball. She's dead. She's probably been dead for hours. Godfrey looked down at the cold, white face of his dead wife. He felt an enormous relief, and he felt guilty about his evil wishes and his relief. He wished that he were a stronger man, that he could confess everything now and claim the child as his own and provide for her. But then he would lose Nancy. He looked over at the child by the fire. She was not asleep yet, and her big blue eyes looked back at Godfrey with no sign of recognition. Then she looked away from him and gazed up with loving interest at the weaver's face. Again, Godfrey felt relief, though mingled with sadness, because his own child did not recognise him. Come on, Godfrey. There is nothing more we can do here, said the doctor. Mrs. Winthrop, please see that the body is prepared for burial and help Master Marner with the child. Goodbye, Marner. Godfrey lingered a moment by Silas's chair. Do you really intend to keep the child, Marner? he asked. Yes, Silas replied. She is alone in the world now, and so am I. I will take care of her. Well, allow me to give you something to help buy her clothes, said Godfrey. He placed a gold coin in Silas's hand and hurried out after the doctor. Listen to this extract from Chapter 7 and complete the spaces with the missing information. I'll be glad to come and help you take care of her whenever I can. Thank you, said Silas. But I want to take care of her myself. I would be grateful for your advice about how to take care of her properly, but I want to do it myself so that she will grow fond of me. I am used to cooking and cleaning the house. I can learn to take care of the child, too. So Dolly told Silas how to dress the child, and he did it himself. And the child laughed and gazed at him and pulled his hair as he dressed her. There, you see, said Dolly gently. She's fond of you already. But what are you going to do with her while you work at your loom? Silas thought for a while, then said, I'll tie her to the loom with a long strip of linen. That way she can move about and play, but she cannot go too far. Well, maybe that will work, said Dolly. She hesitated a moment, then said something that had been on her mind all day. And you must take her to church, Master Marner. You should do that for the poor orphan child. She should go to church and learn to say her prayers like my little Aaron does. She probably hasn't even been christened yet. What do you mean by christened? asked Silas. At Lantern Yard, they had used the word baptism, and only grown men and women were baptised. Oh dear, Master Marner, cried Dolly. Did you have no father and mother to teach you how to say your prayers, and that there are good words and good things that will keep us from harm? Part 2 Chapter 8 It was a bright autumn Sunday, sixteen years after Silas Marner had found his new treasure on the hearth. The church bells were ringing, Morning service had just finished and the villagers were coming out of the church. Among them were Silas Marner and Eppie. Silas's hair was white now and his shoulders were bent. He looked like a very old man, though in fact he was just fifty-five. Eppie, walking beside him, was the freshest blossom of youth, a blonde, dimpled girl of eighteen. A handsome young man was walking behind her. I wish we had a garden, father, said Eppie, 
as they went out into the lane. But to make a garden, first you must do a lot of digging, and you couldn't do that, could you, father? Yes, I could do it, child, if you like. Why didn't you tell me before that you wanted a garden? I'll dig the garden for you, Master Marner, said the young man, and I'll bring you some good soil from Mr. Cass's garden. He'd be glad to let you have some. Ah, thank you, Aaron. That will make it much easier, said Silas. Eppy blushed and smiled. Mrs. Winthrop told me that Aaron would be happy to help. Otherwise, I would not have asked. It would be so nice to have flowers and sweet-smelling herbs. I would love to have lavender, too, but only fine ladies have lavender in their gardens. I can get you some lavender, said Aaron eagerly. I can bring you anything you want from Mr. Cass's garden. When I'm working there, I trim the plants, and usually I just throw the trimmings away. But if you put them in water, they grow roots, and then you can plant them in your garden. Well, be careful not to take anything that they would miss at the Red House, said Silas. Mr. Cass has been very good to us. I wouldn't want to impose on him. You wouldn't be imposing on him. There's so much waste in any garden. Why not give it to someone who could use it? I often think of that when I'm working. If the land were used properly, no one would go hungry. I must go home now, though. Mother will be waiting for me. I'll come to your cottage this afternoon, and we can plan the garden if you like. Oh, yes, said Eppie. And bring Mrs. Winthrop with you. I'm sure she would like to help us decide where the garden should be. Yes, said Silas. She's a very wise woman. With her there to advise us, we will have a wonderful garden. Aaron turned back to the village while Silas and Eppie walked up the lane. Oh, Daddy, cried Eppie, kissing Silas on the cheek. I'll be so happy when we have a little garden. I knew Aaron would dig it for us. I knew that very well. Oh, did you indeed? said Silas, smiling affectionately. Well, you'll owe Aaron a favour if he does all that work for you. No, I won't, replied Eppy, laughing. He wants to do it. When they reached the cottage and Eppy unlocked the door, a small brown dog leapt up to greet them. A kitten was sleeping under the loom, while the mother cat lay in the sunshine by the window. This Happy animal life was not the only change in Silas's cottage. Many improvements had been made. Once in a while, Mr. Godfrey Cass had sent fine pieces of furniture from the Red House. The villagers thought it was very kind of him, but, after all, it was only right that he, a rich man, should help the poor weaver who was raising an orphan child. After lunch, Silas and Eppy went out to walk around and plan the garden. As they passed the small bush where her mother had died, Eppy said, I would like to move the bush into our garden, Daddy. Silas had told Eppy all about her mother and how he had found Eppy on the hearth and how her mother had died in the snow. Silas had given her the gold wedding ring her mother had worn. Eppy kept it in a box and looked at it often. That's a good idea, Silas replied. That bush is very pretty in the spring when it's covered with yellow flowers. We'll need a wall around the garden too. Otherwise the donkeys will get in and eat all your plants. There are lots of big stones by the pit, said Eppy, leading Silas towards the abandoned quarry. We can use those to build a wall. When they reached the edge of the pit, Eppy looked into it and cried, Look how much lower the water is than usual. Ah, yes, said Silas. That's the drainage. Mr. Cass is draining this whole area so that he can plant in the fields beyond the pit. How strange it will seem to have the old quarry all dried up, said Eppy. She lifted a large stone from the ground. This is the kind of stone we need to build our wall, she said. Put it down, Eppy. It's too heavy for you, said Silas. You need someone strong to help you, and I'm not strong enough now. He sat down on the grassy bank and looked thoughtful. Eppy dropped the stone and sat down beside him. Father, she said, 
very gently. If I got married, would I wear my mother's ring? Silas looked surprised at her question. Why, Eppie, are you thinking of getting married? Eppie smiled and blushed. Yes, I have been this past week, she said, ever since Aaron asked me to marry him. And will you marry him, Eppie? asked Silas a little sadly. Yes, sometime, said Eppie. I don't know when. But if we do get married, we will all live together, you and Aaron and I, and you won't need to work any more. It is getting difficult to find weaving work these days. Besides, you deserve a rest. Aaron says he will be as good as a son to you. And would you like that, Eppie? asked Silas, looking at her. Yes, but only if you would like it too, father. Well, you're very young to be married. We'll ask Mrs. Winthrop what she thinks. I'm getting old now, and I like to think you will have someone to take care of you when I'm gone. Then you would like me to get married, father? asked Eppie in a trembling voice. I think I would, said Silas. Listen to this extract from Chapter 9 and choose the appropriate answer A, B, or C. One afternoon, Godfrey went to the abandoned quarry to see what progress was being made in the drainage. He said he would be home by tea time. At four o'clock, Nancy was sitting by the fire, reading a book. Godfrey rushed into the room, pale and trembling. Why, Godfrey, what is the matter? asked Nancy in surprise. I have had a, a terrible shock, he replied. It's Dunstan, my brother Dunstan, who disappeared sixteen years ago. They have found him, found his body, his skeleton. The drainage is finished, and all the water is gone from the abandoned quarry, and there he is. He has been lying there for sixteen years at the bottom of the pit. They found his watch and his ring. There's no doubt that it is Dunstan. Do you think he drowned himself? asked Nancy. No, uh, he fell in. Uh, Nancy, I'm sorry to have to tell you this. Dunstan was the man who robbed Silas Marner. All the weaver's money was there in the pit. Nancy blushed red. She felt it was a terrible disgrace to have a criminal in the family. Godfrey was silent. He was staring at the floor, and Nancy knew that he had something more to say. Chapter 10 That evening, Silas and Eppie sat alone in the cottage. On the table in front of them were the piles of gold, Silas's old gold Come home at last. Sometimes, said Silas, when you were first here, I used to think that you might turn back into the gold by magic. The gold had gone, you see, and you had come in its place. At first I thought that you might go and the gold come back. But after a little time I knew I loved you more than the gold. I needed your voice and the touch of your little fingers. You were little then. You didn't know how much your old father loved you. But I know now, father, said Eppie. If you had not taken care of me, I would have been sent to the workhouse. And there would have been no one to love me. The blessing was mine, my precious child. If you hadn't been sent to save me, I would have lived the rest of my life in misery. The money was taken away from me to help save me. And now it has come back just when it is needed for you. Our life is wonderful. At that moment, there was a knock on the door. Why, good evening, Mr. and Mrs. Cass, said Eppie in surprise as she let them in. We are disturbing you very late, my dear, said Nancy, taking Eppie's hand and looking at her with interest and admiration. Good evening, Marna said Godfrey, as Eppie placed two chairs for them, then went and sat beside Silas. I'm glad to hear you got your gold back after all these years. I am very sorry that it was one of my family who robbed you, 
and I want to compensate you for it in any way I can. Whatever I can do for you will be nothing but paying a debt, and I owe you for more than the robbery. Godfrey hesitated. He and Nancy had agreed not to tell them that he was Eppie's father yet. He wanted to wait until Eppie knew him better. Silas was always nervous when speaking to gentlemen like Mr. Cass, big, powerful, red-faced men, usually seen on horseback. I have a lot to thank you for already, sir, and the robbery was not your fault, he replied shyly. That may be the way you see it, Marna, uh, but I see it differently. You have been working hard all your life. Now it's time for you to rest. How old are you? I'm fifty-five, said Silas. Well, you may live another thirty years, like old Mr. Macy. That gold on the table will not be enough to keep you comfortably for all that time. For working people, that gold seems a lot of money, almost too much. And Eppie and I don't need very much. Godfrey was finding it surprisingly difficult to come to the point. It had all seemed so simple when he had thought about it at home. You have been very kind to Eppy for the past sixteen years. I'm sure you would like to see her well provided for. Mrs. Cass and I have no children of our own. We would like to take care of Eppy and make her a lady. We would treat her in every way as if she were our own daughter. I'm sure you would be glad to see her fortune made in that way. As Godfrey spoke, Eppy put her arm around Silas. She could feel him trembling violently. Eppy, my child, said Silas, what do you think? I won't stand in your way. Thank Mr. and Mrs. Cass. Eppy's cheeks were flushed with distress. She knew that her father was suffering. Thank you very much, madam, and you, sir, but I can't leave my father. I don't want to be a lady. I just want to stay with the people I know. Silas grasped her hand and sobbed with relief. <laughs> there were tears in Nancy's eyes. She felt sympathy for Eppy, but she also felt sadness for Godfrey. Godfrey felt irritated at this unexpected opposition. It had taken him so long to do the right thing. He had been so eager to come to the cottage and make his offer. Now he found it difficult to understand other people's feelings. It is my duty to tell you, Marna, that Eppy is my own child, he said. Her mother was my wife. I have a natural claim on her. Eppy went pale, but Silas flushed with anger. If you are her father, sir, why didn't you say so sixteen years ago, before I began to love her? If you take her from me now, it will be like taking the heart out of my body. God gave her to me because you did not want her, and now he looks upon her as mine. You have no right to her. She has been calling me father for sixteen years. I thought you would be glad that we could give Eppie a better life, said Godfrey, growing angry. She is now old enough to marry. If she stays with you, she will marry some low working man. I know I should have done my duty before, and I am grateful for what you have done for Eppy. But now I want to do my duty. I insist on taking care of my own daughter. Silas was afraid that what Godfrey said was true. He certainly did not want to stand in Eppy's way to deny her the chance of a better life. Eppy held his hand tightly in her own and said, Thank you, sir and madam, for your offers. But I would be miserable if I left my father. He has loved me and taken care of me all my life, and I will love and take care of him for the rest of his life. No one shall ever come between us. But Eppy, said Silas, 
Perhaps one day you will be sorry if you choose to stay among poor people with small houses and poor clothes when you could have had the best of everything. No, I won't be sorry, Epi replied. I don't want fine clothes or a carriage or a big house. I want a little home where my father can sit in the corner and I can do everything for him. I like working people and their way of life. And I've promised to marry a working man who will come and live with my father and help me take care of him. At this point, Epi burst into tears. <laughs> Nancy looked at Godfrey. His face was flushed and his lips were trembling. Let's go, Nancy, he said. Nancy took Epi's hand and said, We'll come back and talk about it another time. Remember that we wish you well, my dear. And you too, Mana. Then she followed her husband out of the door. As they rode home in the carriage, Nancy held Godfrey's hand. Well, that's over, he said after a while. Yes, said Nancy. We can't force her to come to us if she doesn't want to. I'll do all I can for her in the life she has chosen. We won't tell anyone that I am her real father. It can't do any good now. She's a pretty girl, isn't she? Yes. Her hair and eyes are just like yours. I'm surprised I never noticed it before. Will you be very sad, Godfrey, because she won't come to us? Perhaps, for a little while. But Mana was right. I didn't want her when she was little, and now it's too late. But I have no right to be unhappy. I've got you. If you could resign yourself to our childless state, said Nancy, I think we could be happier than we have been. Then I will. At least it's not too late to change that. Chapter 11 the next morning, as Silas and Epi were having breakfast, he said, Epi, there's something I would like to do. I have been thinking about it for two years. Now that the gold has come back, we can do it. Do what, father? asked Epi. Go and see the place where I used to live. I want to go to Lantern Yard and see Mr. Parston, the minister. Something may have happened to show them that I was innocent of the robbery. Mr. Parston is a very pious man. I want to ask him about the drawing of the lots. And I want to tell him about the religion of the people here and ask him what he thinks of it. Long ago, Silas had told Dolly Winthrop the story of his time at Lantern Yard, and Epi had often heard Mrs. Winthrop and her father discussing it. It had been a great relief to Silas to tell somebody after all his years of silent sorrow. Dolly had listened with sympathy, but the religion of Lantern Yard was so different from the religion of Ravelot that Dolly found it all very strange indeed. She had asked him to explain about the drawing of the lot several times, but even then she did not fully understand. Epi was delighted with the idea of going on a journey with her father. When she came home, she would be able to tell Aaron all about it. Aaron seemed to know so much more than she did about many things. It would be pleasant to be able to tell him something for a change. So, the next day, Silas and Epi set out on their journey. When they arrived at the great industrial town, Silas was amazed at how different it was from the town he remembered. Many changes had taken place in thirty years. I don't think I can find my way to Lantern Yard, Epi, said Silas. It's all so changed. Both of them felt ill at ease, standing in the busy, noisy street, surrounded by strange, indifferent faces. Well, ask someone the way, father, said Epi. Ask that gentleman over there. He won't know, Silas replied. Gentlemen never went to Lantern Yard. It was a place for simple working people. 
But I could ask him the way to Prison Street. I'm sure I'll be able to find Lantern Yard once I get to Prison Street. The gentleman told them how to get to Prison Street, and Silas and Eppie set off in the direction he had indicated. They got lost several times and had to ask other people for directions before they found Prison Street. The dark walls of the great jail cheered Silas up. At least the jail had not changed, and Silas now felt confident that he could find the yard. What a dark, ugly place! cried Eppy. It hides the sky. It's worse than the workhouse. I am glad that you don't live here now, father. Is Lantern Yard like this street? My precious child, said Silas, smiling. It isn't a big street like this. I never liked this street, but I was fond of Lantern Yard. Don't worry, we're nearly there. They turned onto a dark, narrow road. Oh, father! cried Eppy. I feel as if I were suffocating. I never imagined that people lived like this, so close together. How pretty Ravelo will look when we get home! You are right, Eppy. Now it looks strange to me too, and it smells bad. I don't think it used to smell this bad. Here and there, a pale, dirty face looked out from a doorway. They made Eppy even more uncomfortable, so she felt relieved when they got to Shoe Lane, where she could see a little more of the sky. There it is," said Silas. "There's Lantern Yard. But how strange! People are coming out of the yard as if they had been to chapel. We never went to chapel at noon on a weekday." Suddenly. He stopped walking and stared with a look of distressed amazement. They were standing in front of a large factory, and men and women were coming out for their midday meal. Father said, "Eppy, in alarm, what's the matter?" "It's gone, child," said Silas. "Lantern Yard is gone. I know this is the right place because I recognise that house across the road." That big factory is where Lantern Yard was. It's all gone, even the chapel and the little graveyard. Come into that brush shop, father," said Eppy. She was worried that he might have one of his attacks. Then you can sit down and rest, and perhaps the people there can tell you what happened. But the man in the brush shop had only been in Shoe Lane for ten years. The factory was already there when he arrived. Neither he nor any of the other people in the shop knew anything about Silas's old friends at Lantern Yard. They had never heard of Mister Parston, the minister. The old place has been swept away," said Silas to Dolly Winthrop on the night of his return to Ravelo. "My old home has gone. I have no home but this now. I will never know whether they discovered the truth about that robbery." No, you won't, Master Marner," said Dolly. "There are many things we'll never know. It's God's will. We'll never know what happened, but He knows, and we must trust Him." "Yes," said Silas. "Ever since the child was sent to me, I have been learning to trust. Now she says she will never leave me, so I think I will trust until I die." Conclusion. In the springtime, when the flowers were blooming, the sun was shining, and the fields were full of calves and lambs, Eppy and Aaron were married. Nancy had insisted on buying the wedding dress for Eppy. It was a very pretty white dress with little pink flowers on it. The wedding procession went from the church to the rainbow. In the lead was Eppy, with her white dress and her golden hair, looking like a lily. One of Eppy's hands was on her husband's arm, and the other held the hand of her father, Silas. After them came Ben and Dolly Winthrop. Nancy saw them passing by as she stood at the window of the red house. Godfrey had gone away for the day. Otherwise, people would have expected him to go to the wedding feast he had ordered at the Rainbow. 
Dolly Winthrop saw old Mr. Macy sitting in his doorway as they passed. He was too old to go to the wedding feast. Dolly guessed that he would like them to stop and talk to him. We must go and say hello to Mr. Macy, said Dolly. He'll be offended if we don't. So they stopped at Mr. Macy's door and shook the old man's hand. In the Garden of the Rainbow, all the guests were gathered, talking about the strange history of Silas Marner. They had come to the conclusion that he had brought a blessing on himself by being a good father to a poor orphan child. When the wedding party appeared at the gate, the guests cheered and applauded. Eppy, Aaron, Silas and Dolly left the wedding feast while the party was still very merry. As they walked back to Silas's cottage, they passed Eppy's new garden, and the flowers seemed to smile at the four united people. Oh, father, said Eppy, what a pretty home ours is. I think nobody could be happier than we are.